Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Ajahn. Good morning to you all. Morning, Ajahn. Good morning. <laughs> I do have some brain scans of um, that was produced by Harvard Medical School on the uh, brains of practitioners. I uh, have about four such scans. Would you be interested to have a look? Uh, nah, not really. No? Okay. <laughs> Thanks anyway. <laughs> uh, sometimes the science behind meditation is one thing, but I'm more like the feeling in meditation, sometimes which scans can't really sort of catch. And what you can catch is just a smile on people's faces and the happiness inside and the joy. So that's, that's something else. Anyway, well, thank you for, your, for the offer. It's very kind of you. I appreciate it. It's 9 a.m. You can fire away. <laughs> fire away. <laughs> it's amazing sometimes in our language, fire away, as if we're going to war and firing shots from rifles and cannonballs and stuff. Anyway, that's our language. And so welcome everybody to another day on this retreat. And oh, I've got a picture of everybody in the hall. That's wonderful. And one of the things I'm going to talk about today I just, just, I make this up as, as usual as I go along and try and not just say the same old things every time, but to add some more information about a wonderful practice of meditation. There's something which I mentioned in passing uh, yesterday. I said that for, to be successful in meditation, you have to be quite skilled in the use of your emotions rather than the intellect. Meditation is an emotional journey rather than a thinking and naming and trying to capture things in words type of journey. In other words, you feel your way with your emotions, especially positive emotions, into the meditation world. And that's one of the reasons why even when we start meditating, it's great to be able to create a sense of positive happiness and joy and peace or whatever it is. which can inspire your mind onto an object, not through force, not through trying to get somewhere, but just enjoying being here. That's one of the big problems in meditation that because of our world, we always feel we have to make progress, we have goals, we have something we want to achieve. But in meditation, it's something totally different. In meditation, we're not trying to achieve anything, which we don't already have. We're trying to be here and trying to really appreciate what it is like to be here and trying to recognize the sometimes wonderful qualities which we ignore about our present moment and where we are. It is just too easy in our modern world to find fault you know, with our existence and see all the things wrong you know, with today and the government and the economy and the, the health and COVID and all sorts of other stuff. But to be a skilled meditator, you see something beautiful in this moment. And you are at ease with those positive emotions. Even when those positive emotions get so incredibly strong, you get so much joy, so much happiness, even something like peace. Peace is an emotion which many people just don't know of because there's very little there for the mind to grab onto at first. And because it is something which is so profound, that sometimes people see peace, or peace comes to visit you, and you don't even let her in, into your house, into your mind. Sometimes we want to analyze peace, rather than just let peace be. So this is one of the reasons why, that during meditation, you develop a huge amount of emotional skill and wisdom, 
which allows you to go even deeper into the mind without any of the negative emotions like fear. Now, yesterday I did uh, talk about some of the hindrances, but there are only some of the hindrances, the traditional five hindrances, which the Buddha said. But there are others who are more subtle hindrances, and fear is one of them. Sometimes we wonder what we're we afraid of. And in the meditation, one goes to deeper and deeper beautiful states of mind. And the first simile I'm going to bring up now is the simile of the, when you go to a new place or a new hotel, if you're staying overseas or you're staying in a hotel in Singapore for this retreat. I you know, go to hotels a lot in the past. I'll go to different places to stay, to teach retreats or to give talks. And because you go to a different place, the first night I spend in a new room, even it might be like a five-star hotel, and the room is really comfortable, even so, the first night in a new place, I never sleep that well. It's just the nature of the body. It's a new place, and the, the nature of the body and the mind means it can't really relax as I relax in my old bed where I've slept so many, many, many times. But it's usually one or two days, and you get used to your new apartment, your new bed, your new room. And when you get used to it, you get what I call the experience of familiarity. And I've seen that in our retreat centers, which we go to. And as we go to you know, our retreat center, or my retreat center, when people first go there, they don't know what to expect, they don't know what to do, and they're always really quite tense the first day, the first night. It's one of the reasons why I've deliberately you know, tried to be fun, to smile, to be non-threatening, so that people, if they go to a retreat center, it's not that long before they feel they're at home. They feel this is a nice place, a kind place, a welcoming place, a place with no fear, so they can relax there. And so, soon, I hope that you go to these retreat centers or other places, and then you feel that this is just like your old bedroom, it's your old home. You feel content and unthreatened there. And the next stage after familiar, familiarity is, is this ease. Now you go to your room and it's already, you're calling it my room, my bed, my place. And even though it doesn't belong to you, even though you're just visiting, still you're at ease there. And those three stages, for want of a better word, of recognition, familiarity and ease. You notice that if you go to a new job, you know, we need to know who's who and where the toilet are and what you should be doing, how you should be dressed. All of those three stages happen so often in our life. The recognition, the familiarity and the ease. And we try to get to that state of ease as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And that does take, you know, the emotion of fearlessness and it's often emotion of trust. And one way to establish that emotion of fearlessness is to, this is a very simple rule. And again, you've heard it before, the simple rule of the 70% rule, 70%. And this originated when I was a school teacher and had to, to set the first examination in maths for my students at a high school in Devon. And I didn't know what to do. And so when you don't know what to do, you always ask someone who's seen it, who's done it before, so they can give you some advice. And the teacher I asked gave some wonderful advice, which I extended to other parts of my life and other parts of my teaching. And that teacher said, Two things, don't set the examination too hard. That's probably one of the worst things you can do. If it's a very tough test, and so the students only get 10, 20, 30% on average, all of those students will come out of that exam thinking they can't do maths. They'll lose their sense of encouragement, their sense of ability, and they will fear maths in the future. And I think that 20, 30% is a failure. It's not a failure, it's just the teacher set the exam too hard. It's not their fault. So don't set it too hard. 
And next, don't set it too easy. If everyone gets 100%, 95%, then the exam is pretty worthless. He said, try and set the average score to 70%, 70%. Because if a child gets 70% in an exam, that's not a bad score. People think, yeah, they can do maths or they can do whatever you're examined on. And the 30% where you know, they get it wrong, that is the most important part of the exam for the teacher. That's where you find the weak points of your students. That's where you find what they didn't understand, what I thought they'd understood, but they didn't quite get it yet. So the next tests, I can focus on those weak points. When we look upon life, whether it's a meditation or just life in general, there's a huge learning experience. We understand about the nature of ourselves and relationships and life, and that we're growing and getting the insights, the understandings to make us a better, wiser human beings. If we understand that that is an important part of life, and we understand that that 30% where we make mistakes, that is like the cold face, for want of a better word, the cutting edge of our life. That is where we learn, where we grow, where we develop. So he said, set it for 70%. If you set it for 70% and the kids get about 70%, then you're being a good teacher. You're being able to take those children further in their understanding of maths with encouragement, but also finding out their weak points. And I thought that that was just a wonderful simile for life in general. And because of the context of meditation, it's a wonderful simile for meditation. So don't try to be perfect, but don't try and be stupid. Just find this wonderful place where, yeah, you're growing and you're learning. You're learning from the mistakes, but you're also being encouraged that the meditation is working, getting some peace, some happiness, some joy, some insight. And so that becomes the very, very best. To be able to do that, it means we're taking away this emotion of fear. I can't do this. I've got to prove myself. You don't need to prove yourself at all in meditation. You need to sort of be here, see what's here, see what you have, and then work from that. So because of that, I did mention one type of meditation where to some people who find they have a lot of pain, a lot of disappointment, they've got no energy, they're just all sorts of negative stuff going on in their, in their mind when they close their eyes and sit down to meditate. And everybody has that sometimes. I did mention that sometimes I feel really tired, exhausted, or last few days really hot. It's a cooler day today again, so thank you for that. But when you are sort of feeling oh, not sort of tip-top shape, then you do this, the Empress Three Questions meditation, which is, it's not a different type of meditation. It's actually getting to the core of what meditation is without too much extra detail involved. The simplicity is sometimes the best. Often it is the best. Sometimes we complicate our life and our meditation way too much. And of course, the Empress Three Questions meditation it's so obvious that now is the only time we ever have in the whole world. That now is all the past is just memories, and sometimes those memories are inaccurate. You cannot, you cannot trust the past. You cannot even believe your own memories of what happened. Sometimes I was certain that I did something, and then I checked out later, and I didn't. I said, how did that happen? It is because when you remember something from the past, you're not actually remembering the past. You're remembering the last time you remembered it. The last time you remembered it was remembering the previous time you remembered it. And so there was this game which we used to play at school. And I don't know why they called it Chinese Whispers. But you may have known that game where there's a long line of kids in the schoolroom. And the teacher whispers something to the first kid. And that kid has to whisper it to the next kid in line, who whispers it to the next kid in line, who whispers it to the next kid in line. And it gets to the end of the line that what the last kid thinks they heard or says they heard is sometimes totally different from what was told to the first kid. Every time it's repeated, it's altered slightly. That's the same thing with memory. 
And of course, my favorite example of that was, was something which really happened during the First World War in Europe. And you know that in military, there's a whole line of command, which allows for this distortion of information to happen very easily. It's the hierarchy. And so the major general told the lieutenant general, send reinforcements, we're going to advance. Send reinforcements, we're going to advance. And the lieutenant general told the colonel, the colonel told his lieutenant colonel, Lieutenant Colonel told the Major, the Major told the Captain, the Captain told the Sergeant, the Sergeant told the Corporal, and the Corporal told the troops. And by this time it had changed slightly. And to understand this, in that time, in the 1914 to 18, the British currency was pounds, shillings and pence, pennies. And so the... <laughs> the order of send reinforcements we're going to advance became send three and four pence we're going to a dance well that's really funny especially when this is war and people are killing each other and so because of that you understand even how our memories of the past are altered and distorted so they cannot be trusted and to me, that's not scary. That's just sort of good over the past. We're not really trusting it, but I can trust what's happening in the present moment. And I think, why am I afraid of the present moment? Why do I rely so much about the past to think something really bad happened? And why does it always have to leave a strong residue? Why can't I just let it go, leave it alone, let it disappear? People say it leaves indelible scars on your mind and sometimes even on your body. Does it? Is, are these things indelible? Cannot we let them go? And if you have the confidence and the, and the emotional strength, you can let these things go. You can move away from them. And so they hardly bother you at all. There's this more important emotions to deal with right now. Of course, the other thing is worrying about the future. How long is COVID going to last? Ah, what's it going to do to the economy? Ah, what is that lump in my breast? Ah, you don't know what it is. It came, it can go. Sometimes you know, even doctors don't know exactly what's happening. We have our theories. Because those theories are often being revised. Because basically, this is the truth, I think you should know, that everybody's body is different. Here we have some common features, common ways we work, but no two bodies are the same. So no two tumors are the same, no two cancers can be the same. They fall into a, a general um, type of cancer, mostly because where it arises, but no two are the same. So even doctors are trying the best. Well, it should be like this, it should be like that, but there's too many anomalies to actually to trust that, which is one of the reasons why, that instead of being afraid of the future, we can change our emotions to looking at our future as being the adventure. Like when you were reading a book, a nice novel, you don't just rush to the end of the novel to find out what happens in the end. You just, you enjoy the suspense, you enjoy the, the journey, uh, because that's the novel, that's where you're learning. Just to look to, you know, what happens in the end. We'll be missing the path. And it's the same with just, I'm not quite sure these days because you know, I'm not that computer literate, but you know, if you see a movie on TV, I'm not sure if you can just fast forward and see what happens in the end. <laughs> I'm not sure. Even so, that I'm sure that the movies haven't changed that much in all the years. It's usually boy meets girl or girl meets boy, one of those two scenarios. And there's some war and just their romance just gets interrupted by something. And then eventually this is the bad guys, but usually the, the good guys win just at the very end, just by the skin of their teeth. But you know they're going to be okay in the end. 
that's the movies. I used to watch it. Notice about monster movies. I'm going off track here, but please excuse me, but this is a nice insight. In the monster movies, just the, the monsters, the demons, whoever it is, I don't know why, but they always seem to attack the beautiful girls. If you were sort of fat and old, the monsters would leave you alone. I don't know why, <laughs> because that was just called entertainment. Anyway, let's go back to the emotions of meditation. After a while, one learns how to make a nice peaceful mind. And again, peaceful mind, I, I mentioned in all those guided meditations, that one becomes aware of your mind. And now I'm going to introduce a little, it's a guided meditation, I, I must admit, but it's only about two minutes of guided meditation. Don't change your posture. Actually, your sitting is fine. But I just want you to, to listen as I say this word, peace. Peace. If you wish, you can close your eyes. Peace. Peace. And see if you can feel peace. 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 Can you feel the peace? You can open your eyes now. By saying that word, peace, your mind just automatically, it's nothing to do with you, it's just how your mind works. It goes towards the meaning of that word. It goes towards the emotional truth of peace. You start to feel that peace. You start to know her very well. And peace becomes something you can turn to so easily. You don't need to meditate in the sense of crossing your legs and sitting on the floor and doing all this other stuff. You can just say peace to yourself. Just visualize it. Make it real for you in your mind. And it's there for you. You're at peace. And that's something you can do at any time during your day. Or at night time, when people asked me yesterday, it was a very good question. They couldn't sleep well at night. How can you go to sleep easily when sometimes you're in pain, physical pain or just burdened by all your responsibilities and duties in the world? How can you just let go? Rah! I know I'm supposed to do it, but I can't do it. Rah! I know it's going to hurt me because I can't go to sleep and I'm going to be tired in the morning. What should I do? And that's a wonderful little, very quick, easy meditation to do. Peace. 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 You can feel it. Or any other time in the meditation to, go, uh, to create peace in your mind so quickly. And obviously, the more times you do it, the more times you practice it, the more you get to know what peace is. And it becomes like a friend always there for you. And you don't need to have the email number or the uh, WhatsApp address or whatever, you just uh, think of it, or just not think, that's the wrong word. You just bring it to your mind. You trust it, you're with it, and then you're there. So anyway, I was, <laughs> I was supposed to be talking about the Empress Three Questions meditation, but I, I, I don't mind my mind just going off and doing interesting things like explaining how to create peace in your mind. Even during the meditation, it's not going anywhere. Well, stop watching the breath, watch peace and have some peace in your mind for a while. And then whatever other meditations you're doing, it really enhances it. So anyway, the Empress three questions, especially if you've got a really unfortunate body today or you're sick or a tummy ache or whatever, then you just uh, 
now in time to have present moment. It's such a truth. It should be easy for everybody to understand that. And, and the next thing to do is what are you aware of? What's actually in your mind right now? You don't judge it. You don't say, I don't want this. I want something better. You don't try and hold on to it. You just, it's here, it's now. Never do with it, it's to care for it. And the idea of care is a very beautiful word. Sometimes I even do that as a type of meditation because caring again is another emotion. The emotion of looking at something and respecting it, allowing it to be. Well, as the way I say it for my own father, because that has emotional uh, weight for me, is that that's W-E-I-G-H-T. Uh, is to say the door of my heart's open to you. No matter what you are, no matter who you are. And that's unconditional love and care for this moment. It's one of the reasons why, you know, I always mess around with words like mindfulness, call it kindfulness, add a little bit extra to it. That's another little word for those who teach mindfulness, to call it unconditional mindfulness. Because the unconditionality of what you're being aware of means you, you allow it to come in. You don't go and chase it away. And I always feel that no matter what I'm experiencing, it's like here for a reason. It's come to teach me something. And I'm really missing out if I chase it away. So instead of whatever emotion, feeling, experience I have to deal with right now, come in. And being able to care for it means it lessens its intensity. It's, you know, it's not so harmful anymore. And this comes from an old teaching of the Buddha saying that you know, if it's like suffering or you know, physical, emotional distress, it always has two parts to it. One part is the physical pain and the other part is the emotional reaction pain. And of those two, the emotional reaction is always the worst. That is the one which hurts the most. It's really hard to actually to uh, explain that, but I'm sure that some of you have done that before. You've been in quite a lot of agony for one reason or another. And then you give some emotional support. You care for your body or someone cares for you. They tell you a joke or they give you some confidence in this moment that life is not so bad. So you don't react so negatively to the enormous pain. And if you can do that, if you do do that, you find out, wow, the pain just lessens in its intensity you know, to maybe 10% or 5% of what it was like before. And it becomes easy to bear. It is the emotional reaction, which is the most painful on difficult experience of suffering in life. And so when we do that, now is the most important time. Whatever is in front of you right now, whatever you're experiencing now, you don't have to name it, you don't have to capture it, you don't have to even explain it to yourself. It's an emotion, a feeling. Care for it. Let it be. Open the door of your heart to it. Smile at it, if you like. And this is not just something you do, but it's like a welcoming, a fearlessness. And the emotions are being trained to actually to be open to whatever happens. And sometimes people think, oh my goodness, such a problem. Might be okay for you to do that. You're a pretty healthy young man. <laughs> young man. <laughs> I made a slip there, didn't I? <laughs> You're a very healthy old man. But nevertheless, that when you do open your heart to whatever you're the pain, the difficulty, whatever it is, is, is occurring, you actually find that again, the pain lessens. You're more at peace. The emotional part is taken away. The emotional uh, inflammation, the extra which you add to it, is removed. And the body can deal with the pain pretty quickly. Now we all know that things come and things go. That's always with pain. It never, never lasts that long. Things that it does last that long is because you're making it last that long. You're trying to get rid of it instead of just understanding it, getting to know it. 
You get to know it, you have to be with it and be its friend. And when you're its friend, you get to know all about the unpleasant emotions of life. They're down my summer. You have the wonderful emotions of life. And they're always there for you. I don't know why it is that people often, they choose negativity in their life. It's weird. I've always had a very positive mind and uh, to know about that. Oh, it was many, 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 many years ago. Many years ago when I was an attendant to one of the monks in, in England and they were going to a teacher retreat. And this was in the, the town of, yeah, it was called Doncaster, I think. And it was a very, Doncaster was like a coal mining town, I think. And it was in the time of Margaret Thatcher had coal, closed down all the coal mines in that part of England. And it meant that every, most people were out of work. It was a very depressed town. And I remember the locals were surprised. They said, well, you're coming on a weekend to Doncaster? On a weekend, people usually leave the town to go somewhere more beautiful and pretty. But no, it was a town. We were trying to do something good for the, the Buddhists in that town. And in the morning, we went for a walk and our host asked, where did you go for a walk? I went to the gardens and we went to the, you know, the flower. Beds. And we were, my uncle went there earlier and he went to the, to the industrial area, the canal, the gas works. And we were laughing. Why would anybody want to go down to those places? You know, if you're visiting and going for a walk somewhere, I like going to the beautiful parts. It's the beautiful parts attract me, not the sort of the negative parts. And so that's the same with my mind. We always tend to be attracted to the beautiful parts of the mind. So you have an experience, and sometimes a bad experience, you can always find something good in it. Instead of seeing the two bad bricks, you always see the 998 good bricks. Instead of seeing the dog poo, dog shit, as something which is smelly and difficult, you see it as fertilizer. So you have to do it in life, which means you're developing this beautiful positive emotion of being attracted to the, the beauty of life, or what the Buddha called the perception of the beautiful. And so, you know, that for those of you who are you're on retreat today. Yes, I'm on retreat. Wow. I don't have to do so much. I don't have to worry about my family. I don't have to worry about the work. I can just sit down and just have a wonderful meditation today. For those of you, you know, who are usually the teachers, today you've got a day off. I'm doing that work for you. Thanks to the banks. You enjoy the fact that you don't have to do anything. It's weird. We'll be able to take that opportunity, that beauty to have some rest. For they're always busy. Even when they're just meditating, always thinking or writing biography or figuring out the meaning of life. Why, why do you do nothing? Of just being here. And again, just doing nothing. That was one of those perceptions which I've told you so many times. When I used to go traveling, go to these huge cities like San Francisco or New York or LA, London and Toronto and um, where else? Seoul, Jakarta, Singapore, KL. When you went to those cities, I said, it's really, really, really rare in those big cities to see a human being. Or Singapore, or KL. Lots of human goings, lots of human doings, but very few human beings. Sometimes you have to be a going, you have to be a doing. But today, you have this wonderful opportunity just to be a being, just being here. Not developing your meditation to go doing stuff so you know you can become more wise and 
have some more teaching tools so the next time you get up there and start uh, or grow, you're just being, that's all. And when you learn how to be, life becomes so easy, so peaceful. You can feel it. You can feel the emotion of peace, the emotion of just freedom. That's another one of my favorite emotions, freedom. Insight practices. Now, people want to be free. And freedom, real freedom, is a great bliss, a great joy. What is freedom? And that's when, you know, reading the Buddhism and understanding how the Buddha taught, you see the two types of freedom. One is real freedom. The other one is just a fake type of freedom. The fake of desire. The freedom. Desire, you can desire whatever you want and go for it and aim for it and reach out for it and travel for it and, and do all the things so you can you can have your freedom of desire. Whatever you want to do, go and do it. And for many people, that's how they live their lives. If they're wealth, wealthy, if they're talented, if they're fit and they have you know, enough of funds to be able to go travel or go see this or do that. The freedom of desire. But you find that's not much freedom at all. You get bored. And actually not bored, you get tired. Tired of running around searching. For... See, you're getting this, more, and that, more of this, more of that. But there's something else which is another type of freedom which is essential to meditation and which is essential to the, the happiness in your life. And that is the freedom from desire. So desire is not affecting you anymore. The desire is like a virus. It affects you and it makes you hot and that stops you being able to, you always have to seek out another, another wanting, another desire another craving, another goal, another thing to achieve. And what one really wants you to achieve and able to share with others is the freedom from desire. So you're going to sit down, be quiet. Desire which is going to, to pull you away or stop you being still. There's nothing you want in the whole world. If you did find a bottle, you rubbed it and a genie came out. And a genius, genie said, Ajahn Brahm, you have three wishes according to the tradition. What would you want? And I'd answer, nothing. But I can give you anything. And get your new retreat center. No, oh, thank you. I can, I don't know, uh, all of the, the weeds in your monastery. No, thank you. The freedom from desire is so powerful. It allows you to rest and be peaceful and appreciate and enjoy. The monastery is there for the peace. The power of the freedom from desire. You can feel the incredible stillness and profundity When people feel oh, there's so much things to do in the world, that's a problem. People are doing so much in the world and they're screwing it up, making it worse, making it hotter, making it just so many more footprints. So it's amazing if you can just sit down, be free from desire and feel what that's like. Of course, freedom from desire, again, it is not a thought is pointing to something. It's what you feel afterwards. The emotion. That's real freedom. Of perceiving what I don't have, I perceive what I do have. 
So I have freedom from desire. But you can make it bigger, better, easier. Oh, yeah. Been there, done that. Now I'm happy where I am. And so that freedom from desire, that deep contentment, that allows you to have some rest. But it also allows you simple things like being able to love your partner. That's really a weird thing. I remember my dear old parents, they always wanted me to improve. And I think that's what they're supposed to do is get higher marks. Well, I was getting pretty high marks. Where's the end of that? There is no end to it. You can always do better. Well, the partner, you know, your husband, your wife, you look at them, they're far from perfect. <laughs> I don't know why I say these things. As, yeah, you know, the, the wife is far from... That's why you are a good match <laughs> to imperfect <laughs> learning together, accepting one another, growing together. Um, love, meta, compassion. You know, it's, it's impossible, it's stupid to have loving kindness to someone who's perfect. That's no challenge. You don't learn much from that. But being kind to someone, forgiving them when they're very um, imperfect. And say, so I just love you for who you are for you. And that's something very profound about that. That's a big emotion, the emotion of acceptance. And how many of you have felt that acceptance from somebody? So you know you're imperfect, you've done things which are wrong and just sometimes you're lazy and whatever your faults are, but the other person will love you anyway. Wow, that just really hits a deep emotional chord inside of you. And that is what we do in meditation. We love ourselves, even though we're imperfect. My meditation is no good, I go to sleep, I'm restless, I can't do this. No, I love that. Be at peace with it. This is what's happening right now. That's all you have, this moment and this experience. And your only duty in meditation is to care for it. I mean, really care for it. Open the door of your heart to this moment, no matter what it is. No matter what it is. And of course, in all the things which I said I teach, I try out myself. It's how I live. And a lot of times there's some incredible experiences, really deep pain, disappointments or whatever. And you love it. And you learn to just sit there and be with this. You're not in deep meditations or nimittas or jhanas. You're just here. And it's not that good. But then you say, door, my heart's open to you. Come in. Care for it to the max. Whatever you do, you have to do it full on, 100%. And then you find it changes. You find <laughs> it changes by itself. You don't change it. You care for it. It's like the monster who came into your meditation or into your life. The dear friend, all the monsters of my life, all the fail, whatever, they become your friends. Literally. And you love them all, and they don't threaten you anymore. But it's wonderful emotional embracing of things. That's why that when you do loving kindness meditation, may all beings be happy and well, not just beings, all events in your life, all experiences, all things which you feel about. If you want to sort of heal the world, you don't heal the world by getting rid of all the negative stuff, it just makes it stronger. Problem. Grace more of that. Acceptance, making peace with things. Wow. It, peace really takes off. It takes off in your meditation. Uh, now's your only time you have. So you're not worried about what you're going to do next. You're not thinking, oh, I've got to do my breath meditation now. It's a very unclear command. I've got to do my breath meditation now. What are you really saying? I've got to do my breath meditation next. 
the meditation, please. There is no such word as next. I only have now. So banish that word from the vocabulary of meditation. There is no next. There is not a few moments ago. It's only this now. Out of meditation, yes, there is next, there is tomorrow, there is what you're going to do this afternoon. But in meditation, when you sort of are sitting down, no next, no yesterday, just now. Calm. And whatever you are experiencing now, just love it to the max, even the unpleasant stuff. I don't think you can't do it. the emotional negativity, physical negativity, the pain, disturbance, whatever has to be there sometimes. But the emotional negativity is gone. And you're, you're seeing this has a value somewhere that I'm learning from this. I used to say to me, just the mosquitoes said, call them your teacher. Anything, those mosquitoes, they really irritated me in time. There's hundreds of them. No mosquito repellent, no coils, no mosquito screens on the huts. You just had no choice. They were going to bite you. <laughs> I remember those old mosquitoes, you had your hand up and you'd, you'd let the mosquito bite. Okay, come on, I'm a monk, I've got compassion. It's, come on, have a drink. And so you let them, you see them just come and land on your hand and they'd, they'd land there and put their nose into your skin. And, you know, sort of irritated a little bit. You know what the blooming mosquitoes did? They just taste. So they walked a couple of steps <laughs> to the left. liked and they drank that advantage of my kindness i could have squatted them if i was a lay person not a buddhist but they took advantage of that but it didn't really hurt that much and gave me a nice little story for talks in the future but that young child when he complained about those mosquitoes he would say call them your teacher ajan mosquito and oh, He said, they become your teachers. So when you have an experience in meditation, which you know you feel is a little bit too much for me, just stay with it. In the moment, this is happening, it's real. And so just open the door of your heart to this moment. And you learn from it. And you learn so much, you become free from it. You're no longer a victim of the mosquito bites. You're no longer a victim of the, the pain or the fever. You're no longer a victim of the cancer. You're not the body. No watching, being with this thing. Open the door of your heart to it. You're learning so much about life, real life, what's actually happening now, not the theories, but the emotions of life. The theories, you can read the books. The theories you can give lectures on, and the theories you can argue with other people on. But the emotional world, you feel that, that is far more real. And when you are very skilled in your emotional world, it becomes pretty easy to meditate. You sit down there, you don't think what I'm supposed to do. You say, what's happening? What are you doing? And how do you feel? What are the emotions right now? And by developing just a simple emotion like peace or like kindness, open the door of your heart to whatever's happening right now and feeling it, feeling it really fully. You find, oh, that's meta meditation. Open the door of your heart to this moment. Oh, that's powerful. Or just uh, letting this moment be. That's when I pronunciation, or just being here. If you're here, you're not restless. If you're here, you're not tired.
if you're here in this moment, images and jhanas, to go into those deeper meditations, again, they're, they're powerful. Where does that power come from? It, it is an emotional power. Like when you're crying, being disappointed. Imagine crying, sheer happiness and bliss. Wow, oh, this is just so great, so wonderful. Because those emotions in deep meditation are powerful, it means you cannot control them. They're more powerful than you, your will. You have to let the will go and just enjoy the bliss, the power of these great states of inner ecstasy. And really, really happy just in this moment. You don't try and attain them. That's one of the biggest obstacles to meditation. When you have an idea or a goal, you try and reach that goal. You become a human going somewhere, a human doing something instead of a human being here. And when you're a human being here, it just gets sometimes. So amazing. And a fear. Because these are emotions which you're not familiar with, you're not at ease with. You have to recognize them there for their safe and just let them be. And soon you become so at ease. When you see limitus in the moment, where you're used to, that's the usual place you hang out with your, with your five senses. And uh, very unusual that sixth sense for you, but it's really, 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 really the best place you could possibly be. And, oh, I just, okay, I'll mention this story to you. <laughs> when I was in Sri Lanka about a couple of years ago, one of the followers over there, I was staying in a hotel at the end of the day, just taking a bit of a rest. Just came in from the, uh, the hotel desk. Says, one of your I was supposed to have a bit of a rest. Anyway, they all came up. Told me this wonderful story. The one of uh, he was a doctor over in Sri Lanka, and the one of his. He would very often get into really, really deep meditations, into jhanas. He was a very skilled meditator, this man, this uh, disciple of the doctor. And this doctor decided to do an experiment on him without telling him. Touch, if you can feel that touch, you're not in the jhanas. And the doctor, Treatment. You know, he sort of swabbed the man's arm with alcohol, you know, just to sterilize it, and got out a scalpel and tried to make an incision in this man's arm. Happens when you get into deep meditations that be cut by anything. And, and just to explain this, these are emotional objects. You're not actually watching the breath anymore. You're not watching the beautiful lights in the jhana. Sorry, the beautiful lights of the nimittas. You just go deep and deeper in. You let go more and more. Very peaceful, very still. It's very, very powerful. 
said, it's not what you do. You can't control them at all. You just enjoy them to the max. So if you learn how to just to develop that emotional skill of trusting things like peace, safe, trusting the Open the door of your heart to this moment. It is seeing what it's there to teach you. It becomes a great friend. It becomes very still. Do anything. The mind is the mind doesn't move, the body gets so incredibly still. And the awareness is oh, so incredibly strong. Sometimes people make the mistake that in the deep meditations like jhanas. Oh my goodness, how long that is. Your awareness is stronger than ever. To get words. So that's why I coined the word superpower mindfulness. Really incredibly strong, just like super. Your mindfulness is much more intense, powerful, beautiful. It is just in your normal life. It's just got the mind, focused, powerful, incredibly enjoyable. This, just the emotional world, is actually the way into the deep jhanas, not the intellectual world. World, giving yourself instructions. Intellectual mind and with the labels, so you run out of. You don't have words for it. Ajahn Shah, you know, it's obviously so many times, you know, he's, he's made words. And they can describe them. Wow, amazing. But, you know, for this is run out early on. Yes, we can feel the beauty. Feel the, the we're getting in some great states. People sometimes complain to you, you know, you monks do all this. And I said, No, you can. Some of you will. I don't know this retreat or the next retreat or some retreat or when you buy instructions because they're powerful and so one day enjoy it to the max oh that time went quickly it's already 9 57 almost is it's uh go with the flow time toilet time so or so whatever. So those of you who need to go to the loo, now is the time. Be careful for your body. Feel safe and feels comfortable. There we go. <laughs> I don't know why this always happens. I've, just before the talk, I thought, what the heck am I going to talk about today? The talk. giving some tips about how to meditate easily. Some water. Okay. Oh yeah. Very good. Shiri, you want to greet Ajahn? Sorry? Ajahn. Hi. Ajahn. How are you? Very happy. Very happy. 
Yeah, having a one. <laughs> Yeah, uh, what's happening today? To you. So happy to see you. We're supposed to be in Gunting. It's very cold there. <laughs> really? Oh. Uh, we're good. supposed to be in To meet you here. Oh, yeah, this is more than good enough. Yes, it's very yeah. good. And sometimes, oh, when I close my eyes and meditate, I don't know actually physically where I am. <laughs> because, you know, you just go out from the, the room you're in, into your body, into your mind, and it can be anywhere in the whole world. And I, I don't know if you've ever had that experience, especially when you do travel. You wake up in the morning and you open your eyes and one of the first things I train myself to do is where am I today? <laughs> what country am I in? <laughs> because, oh yeah, yeah, I'm in Singapore today. Or no, no, I'm in, in Canada today. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just but you know, what's the difference yes. to me? Singapore, Canada, Genting or or KL and the BGF in PJ. What but I see myself as a very good opportunity for me to do my self retreat at home. But yeah. first, yes, this is the first time because I never think I would be able to be really eight precept. Oh, yeah. No internet, no Facebook, nothing, yeah. and just uh, on my retreat mode. But I make it. I'm so happy. Excellent. So you're actually taking control of you know things like the internet. You don't have to be a slave to all those people who send you emails or tweet to you or whatever. You know, you're an independent person. You just tell people out of kindness before, and I'm going to retreat for, for six days or whatever. So, you know, any emails or internet or something, I won't answer. No. Yeah, and that, that's good. And that's you're telling what to do. And then you, you feel that, you know, you are more powerful than the internet, than the emails or the phone calls or the, the WhatsApp or whatever. And it's the same with your food. You know, you've got enough to eat in the morning or lunchtime. You don't have to eat in the evening. No, I didn't eat anything. So I'm very happy. It's a well, very good I, experience. Thank you very much, Ajahn. No trouble. I'm very glad you did that. It's wonderful. Hi, Ajahn. Hi. <laughs> you know, people do have power, but they don't use it. They always feel they have to spend their life pleasing others. And they're in, when they end up pleasing others, they're always like too much of a servant for others. Instead of learning how to say, well, this is what I can do for others. You, you do help others a lot. But then it's time, this is for myself. Or, no, to be more accurate, this is for my no-self. <laughs> this is for my meditation, for my spiritual life. And giving that opportunity is very, very helpful. Sometimes we have nice discussions amongst the monks that, one of those discussions is, is that something which Ajahn Bambadi was saying the other day, and got, and got it from me from years ago, was that sometimes we always think, oh, we're all interconnected. You can be if you want to be, but you know, sometimes I turn off and go into my cave and just totally disconnect from everything. To, to go off grid, as they say, to be disconnected. Just to actually just to go in there and just go inside your body, go inside your mind, and disconnect from the whole world. Oh, amazing. So when you actually do that and disconnect from life, you realize that you know you have the this choice to connect with the world, to serve, to help out. But you're not a prisoner of the world. You're not a prisoner of the news, you're not a prisoner of COVID. You can actually just go into your body and mind and just escape from everything. And that idea of like being free, free from desire, is a, a wonderful power which people just don't use enough. So great, you know, you're on a retreat at home, you're disconnected. Well done.
Okay, dokie. Um, is it time to do the meditation? We set our boundaries. Yeah, exactly. Yes, set your boundaries and set them wisely. And once you set the boundaries, you know, make sure those boundaries are there because they're protecting you and they're protecting others. So enjoy them. Okay, I'm going to set some boundaries now so we can do a, a quiet meditation for 20 minutes or so. Okay. Okay, okay or not, ready or not, here we go. <laughs> so if you like to sit down, close your eyes. And set your boundaries. What other people are doing, any noise you hear, anything from outside of your body and mind, it's none of my business. And anything from the past and future, that too is none of my business. The only business I have is what's happening now. First of all, just learning how to get a nice posture, relaxing your body. So how are your legs now? How do they feel? Can you keep the legs like this for the next 20 minutes? Or more if you're sitting longer. Well, I'm not used to sitting in a chair. When I do this, I realize, my goodness, my posture is terrible. Because <laughs> I've been watching my body. So now I watch my body. My body tells me I've got to sort of adjust my legs and my butt. So I'm going to fidget. And when I was at school, I always got told off for fidgeting. So now I'm just being kind to my body, being compassionate. And that's so much better. I can feel my legs and they feel good. It's almost as they're saying, thank you. Thank you for caring for us enough to be aware and to move us to a much better position. Go through the body awareness a little bit quicker today because we've got more to do. Make sure the butt is okay. And my neck was a bit itchy, so I gave it a scratch. Get the back nice and comfortable. He wants to sit up straight again today. Oh, that feels good. Check out all the inner parts of my body, digestive tract, the tummy, the lungs. Just making sure everything is fine. Stomach. It's got a bit of gas in there, I feel. Just from breakfast this morning. There's not much, it's fine. Go right up the front of your body. And for the women, please pause when you get to your breasts. There's a terrible disease, breast cancer. And sometimes you can catch it early. You can catch it, not just scans, but you can know. There's something a bit out of balance there. You become very mindful and sensitive to your own body. You know there's something which is not quite relaxed, for want of a better word. And if you experience that, stay there. Zoom in, focus in on that part of your body. Not with fear. The emotion of fear just makes things worse. The emotion of kindness, opening the door of your heart to this feeling. If you do the kindness properly, you'll find the feeling changes. 
or was just a bit of a disturbing feeling. It becomes so nice, so peaceful, so warm. As your body does its own healing. You feel it. And that simile of being lost up in the mountains in the mist. You know this is going in the correct direction. Trust that feeling, you know it's going in the correct direction. Things are relaxing, becoming much more of these. Whoa, this is good. I mean, you don't have to go along with me if you're finding any part of this useful, stay there. Then I just go up to my shoulders, relaxing. Down my arms. Down to my hands. My hands in a good position today. Up to my neck. To my head, my face. I feel those sensations around my eyes and my mouth. My emotions are pretty peaceful. Can't see any fear there or anger or irritation. I know that by the feelings around my muscles around the eyes and mouth. It's like people can see if you have any of those negative emotions by the way your face is configured. I relax all of that. And then I can feel my whole body all connected up together. The vehicle in which I live in this life grows older. Maybe, I don't know if it's weaker. Some areas it is. I'm caring for it. I feel it all relax. Get this tingling feeling all over. It's starting the delight of relaxation. Feeling the body feels good. Of course, I can feel that quite easily because I've developed that awareness of that feeling for so many years. I really recommend it. Enjoy the, the delight of bodily relaxation. That delight is an emotion. It takes the body to even more ease and relaxation. I recognize this. I'm familiar with it and I'm at ease. Just takes the relaxation deeper and deeper. Feels good, really good. Whole body at ease. Then to relax the mind. Peace. 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 A mindfulness listens to what the mind experiences after I say that word. Peace. 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 
delight of peace, delightful peace. Delightful peace. You can repeat it to yourself if you wish. So you don't need a word anymore. Because the mind has what the word was describing. I'm going to have to be quiet now five or six minutes.
Venus. Venus. How does this feel emotionally? Getting close to the end of the meditation for me. I love you. The joy of the fear inside. Right now. Slowly move from inside to this shell, which is my body. Start to feel the legs in the butt, in the back, in the hands, in the head. They're all so comfortable. I feel them in my mind. I slowly open my eyes. And smile. to end this short meditation. I don't know if I didn't guide you enough. Hopefully I did. I was just, I was just getting off on it myself, sorry. Anyway, I will now wish you all the best for your lunch and for your afternoon session with Ajahn Prabali. I go and say hello to all the wonderful kind people who brought lunch to our monastery today. Thank you again for giving me the privilege to teach. Happy meditating. Thank you.